Okay, so if we're talking about a high-end road bike, it's gonna have a full carbon frame, maybe with some tasty aero characteristics. <laughs> it's gonna have deep section carbon wheels, a 22-speed group set, and it's gotta have disc brake. Well, today, I'm gonna build that bike for, uh, for a hair over a thousand quid, which is pretty mental, I think. So yeah, let's get to it. Right then, Sirocco, ladies and gentlemen, purveyors of the finest quality cycle clothing, and also a Spanish company, actually. Hola, amigo ciclista. <laughs> I'm back to sponsor another episode, and I've worn Sirocco gear on every ride for over two years now, and they do some great value basics, like this really nice looking jersey here. You can pick this thing up for 34 quid, or these Aspen bib shorts that I've got on. They've got some really nice padding in there, and you can get these for 42 quid. Um, but at least here in the UK, <laughs> autumn is, uh, is here, and pretty soon this summer gear is not gonna cut the mustard. <laughs> But how good does this thing look? So it's one of their new long sleeve thermal jerseys and I've been wearing this thing on some early morning rides over the last week or so and it's so comfy. It's made of some really nice quality fabrics and the pockets at the back are super, super deep there to carry all your stuff. And it's got a really useful little zip up pocket here to carry your cash or your cards or whatever. Um, plus, new socks, merino wool, uh, nothing but the best, darling. Uh, so yeah, if you did want to check out Sirocco, then use my uh, link in the description below. Save yourself 10% off the entire site, which is pretty good. And it also helps me out a little bit as well, which is good because as you will come to realize, this episode was quite expensive to, uh, to put together, actually. Uh, anyway, enough of that, and let's check out this build. Hello, and welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to another I don't trust these new carbon bike frames. You just can't beat an old school frame made out of depleted uranium. <laughs> Trace Fellow uh, production. My name, as always, is uh, yeah, it's Luke. Right then, let's not muck about here. Uh, yeah, today we're building up a dirt cheap carbon road bike frame, um, and it's one of the cheapest builds I've ever done, actually. Now, the final result of the build, it's not actually this bike behind me. This is my old rim brake bike. But the final result of the build you're about to see, I am actually really impressed with it. But the build itself was one of the most annoying ones I've, <laughs> I've ever done, uh, actually. Now, it's worth pointing out, I've paid for everything in this build with my own money, apart from the Senex crank set. So I got sent that for free a few months back and I'm still testing it actually. So it's going on the new build. It costs about 70 quid new, um, but everything else I paid for with my own money. Uh, so <laughs> while this is, you know, a comparatively cheap bike build, this episode still cost me nearly a thousand pounds to put together. So subscribing would be a true blessing. Uh, anyway, <laughs> anyway, enough of that. And yeah, let's build this bike. Okay, right, so as I'm doing the parts rundown here, I'll cover the cost and the weight, if it's applicable, for all these parts I'm gonna show you. And we'll, we'll start here with the, uh, yeah, the backbone of any build, and it's the frame. So I've already done a whole video dedicated to this. It was my last video, actually. And uh, yeah, I assume a lot of you will have seen that already, so I won't go into too much detail here. But this thing is one of the cheapest carbon frames that I've ever come across, and it was 323 pounds, 74p from AliExpress. So yeah, ridiculously cheap for this thing. It's a 58 centimeter aero road bike frame and weighs in at 1,946 grams for the frame, the fork, and the seat post. So not super lightweight, but um, yeah, pretty, pretty good considering it's a large aero frame. Now, there are a couple of little gremlins inside the frame, which I kind of discovered when I looked inside it with an endoscope. And some of the mounting points for the, for the disc brakes and stuff are a little ropey. So this thing is okay, but check out the whole video if you wanna see kind of a detailed analysis of this thing. But the front forks used to look like this, so matte black. Same as the rest of the frame. But if you were, uh, yeah, look up here. So this is my rim brake road bike that I've mounted to the wall. It's got a little flash of neon yellow there. And at the back of the garage here, this is my other disc brake bike. And the frame is from Trifox. Now this used to be red, this part of the fork here, but I do like neon yellow. And it's also on my kind of cycle shoes there. So I took the fork for this build, masked it up, sprayed it with some white primer, and then sprayed it neon yellow 
as well and I think it looks really cool so um yeah here it is so neon yellow fork there matte black frame uh the, the spray paint job is pretty good actually I've definitely improved since the last time I did this um but yeah I, yeah, I think that looks really cool so there we go there's the uh, there's the frame for you so let's check out some of the other parts Right then, handlebars. So I've chosen these. So integrated bar and stem setup here. Again, fully carbon. And these things cost me, uh, what was it? Just under 60 quid from AliExpress. So not too bad at all. They're from a brand called RXL. I've never used any stuff from them before, but they look pretty similar to the stuff that Toseek or Toseek pumps out, if you're familiar with those guys. So um, yeah, you can integrate the cabling through the bar. So cable goes in there and then pops out the bottom there and this shape I'm quite familiar with as well it's the same shape that I've got on my rim brake bike up the top there and it's quite comfortable I find so I'm quite excited to get these on the bike and try them out now weight wise they're 338 grams and just to provide a bit of context here so this set of aluminium bars uh, it's the same size so 40 centimeters wide with a 100 millimeter stem these weigh 455 grams so 455 338 so these are considerably lighter um, but yeah these look really cool so I'm interested to get these on the bike and see what they are like um, anyway let's move on right saddle wise I've got this it's a fully carbon saddle from Toseek um, so it's a carbon top and carbon carbon rails there pick this thing up in 2018 for just under 20 quid and it weighs in at 110 grams so it's pretty lightweight for a bit of context a specialized power saddle slightly more kind of normal saddle I suppose uh, yeah that weighs 234 grams so this thing is considerably lighter and I've stuck a mudguard on the back there now it may look quite uncomfortable but I've ridden this for thousands of miles on a couple of different builds and I find it quite comfy actually um anyway there's the saddle so let's move on right bar tape so this stuff um yeah literally yeah some of the che cheapest stuff I could find five quid on eBay for this so it's the cheapest stuff with no silicon backing or even any kind of uh adhesive backing on this and I actually this is some of my favorite bar tape to install it just it goes on really easily and lasts forever so yeah super cheap bar tape and I've got these bar end caps here so these used to be black but I've painted them neon yellow to match the forks because I'm a I'm a loser basically so yeah, there you go anyway next okay so these are the wheels for the build and again I've reviewed these in a previous video so I might want to check that out if you haven't already but they're a 50 mil deep carbon rim with some pretty standard steel spokes and some pretty pretty basic hubs they're from elite wheels on aliexpress and i paid 265 quid for the pair of these so they're pretty incredible value now i've ridden them for a couple thousand miles already and they weigh in at 1600 grams for the pair so not the lightest things in the world but considering the price i paid yeah i think i can give them a pass on that so yeah pretty decent set of wheels there now they are tubeless compatible however i'm actually going to be running these so i've had a lot of requests to check these out so these are ride now tpu super lightweight inner tubes basically um i picked these up on aliexpress i think i paid 15 quid each for these but i'll have to put the actual price up on the screen um so really interested to try these out because they do offer some pretty tasty weight savings over regular inner tubes now uh, as for tires i'll be using these so these i picked up on wiggle a couple of years ago i've got a pair of these and they are prime race road tires 700 by 25c and these things cost 12 quid i think i paid 12 quid each for these so really great value and they ride quite nicely actually so um there you go there is the setup for wheels and tires okay so this is the group set for the bill, pretty interesting, I think. So it's the L2, or is it L2? RX 12 speed mechanical group set. And all this lot here cost me just over 200 quid on AliExpress. So you get both shifters, rear derailleur, front derailleur, two 140 millimeter disc brake rotors, a 12 speed cassette, some hybrid hydraulic brake calipers, which look pretty nice actually, and a 12 speed chain. So yeah, pretty incredible value. Now the, uh, the group set has some quite tasty little carbon accents as well. So both of the brake levers are made of carbon and so is part of the rear derailleur cage as well. So weight wise, this comes in at 741 grams for both shifters and both derailleurs. Uh, compare that to 105R7000, that's 805 grams for the equivalent there. So this is much lighter. However, it does get trumped slightly by uh, Sensar Empire. Their carbon variant comes in at 713 grams for the same stuff. So, um, but, but still, I think this is pretty competitive in, in the weight department. However, there are a couple of little upgrades for this group set that I'll be making later down the line. 
Okay, so firstly, these hybrid hydraulic brake calipers. I've heard good things from people about how these perform and they seem to be built really nicely as well. Plus, I've used a previous generation of these on another bike and they seem to work really nicely. So really interested to try these out, but I'm gonna pitch these up against these. So these are Juventech GT calipers. And the main difference between the two is that these use four pistons to push the pads onto the disc, whereas these only use two. So a, a piston either side, whereas you can see here, these have got two pistons either side. Now, <laughs> these are considerably more expensive. I think I paid 230 quid for the pair of these calipers, which is pretty ridiculous really, but apparently these should perform much better than these stock ones. So we'll put them up against it um, in, a, in a later video and test it out. And in addition, this is the box standard 12 speed cassette, which comes with the kit. So this um, looks pretty good, but it weighs in at 325 grams and I'll be putting it up against this. So it's another S road cassette. So I've already done a video on these cassettes before in a, in a previous episode, and I wasn't super impressed with them, but I'm gonna be giving them another chance. So this again is a, is a 12 speed one. It weighs 225 grams. So a lot lighter than that one there. So I'll be putting this yeah, up against it, hopefully. I won't come out disappointed like I did the last time with these s -ray cassettes, but we will see. Anyway, there is the, uh, the group set there. So really excited to get this on the bike. Okay, last few bits. So I've got some gear cable housing here. I got this stuff from eBay. I tend to buy it in bulk because I <laughs> re-cable my bikes so often. So you certainly don't need this much, but you can probably pick up some equivalent stuff for about three or four quid on eBay. Now brake cable housing, I use this stuff and I bang on about it all the time. It's Jaguar KEB-SL and it's special compressionless brake housing because it's got some, uh, some Kevlar reinforcing, which you can hopefully see there. So I really recommend this stuff, especially if you're using these mechanical disc brake calipers here. It really helps reduce the sponginess that's kind of inherent with regular brake cable housing. So yeah, recommend this stuff if you can get hold of it. This one cost me about 22 quid on eBay, but shop around because these are usually, well, you can usually find some deals on this stuff. Now pedals, I'm using these Costello pedals, which are some kind of knockoff Time Expresso pedals from uh, AliExpress. And I've already reviewed these in a previous episode and they are honestly growing on me, actually. The bearings seem to be giving out, so I need to throw some more abuse on these and see if they last. But yeah, I'll be using those for the build. And lastly, if I bump up the exposure here, um, yeah, I've got this uh, crank. So this is the Senex PR2, if it's gonna focus there, Senex PR2 crank. So I've had this on this particular bike for a couple, couple thousand kilometers at this point, and I'm gonna continue the kind of review for this particular part. So I'll be taking the bottom bracket out, taking the crank off and transplanting it onto this bike here. So um, without further ado, let's get building. Right, so first things first, let's get the wheels set up. So as I'm using regular clincher tires with inner tubes, I, I assumed this would be easier than faffing around with a tubeless setup. But these TPU inner tubes are not the easiest to deal with. They're super floppy and quite difficult to get seated in place inside the tire. These are not as easy to fit as, as, as regular inner tubes. I don't know if you can see, but they're, they're just, they're really flimsy, don't hold their shape. I mean, I mean that's because they're lightweight, but yeah, they're quite difficult to fit without pinching the inner tube on the tire. So yeah, you've got to take your time with these, that's for sure. But after a little struggle, I eventually got them set up and inflated. All right, let's pump this thing up. See if it holds pressure. That's 75 PSI. Cool, done. Okay, cool, so the tires are all mounted up, which is great. Next step, let's get the disc brake rotors slapped on. So um, yeah, here they are, and they came with the uh, the bolts in the kit. So these are, well, there's 12 here, and they'll take a T25 Torx bit to get them mounted up. So um, I recommend you get yourself one of these if you're doing this. It's a torque wrench, this is a cheap one off Amazon, about 40 quid, I think I pay for this. Goes uh, two to 14 Newton meters, and it comes with a series of uh, bits, including the T25 Torx, which is the one I need. Um, so yeah, I'll need to do them up to, I think it says it there actually, 6.2 Newton meters. So yeah, very, very, very precise. Um, I think about six Newton meters will be fine. So I'll get these uh, slapped on. Now I think I need to do them up in a specific, well it's recommended, you do them up in like a, a star pattern so you can kind of mount it evenly. But um, either way, let's get these stuck on. 
Okay, super straightforward. So set the torque wrench to 6.2 Newton meters and, and yeah, get wrenching. So as you can see, I'm doing them up in the recommended pattern, lest I provoke the wrath of the comments section. <laughs> but yeah, whilst I got away with not having a torque wrench for a number of years, they're definitely worth having. Now, not all the cheaper parts here will come with recommended torque settings, including the frame actually, but you can easily Google some general torque guidelines and it definitely helps with peace of mind when assembling these bikes. Anyway, now the disc brake rotors are fitted. The next step is to fit the cassette on the free hub. Easy, easy, right? Well, yeah, not really. So the cassette on the right is 11 speed and the cassette on the left is the 12 speed one. Now, if I turn them over, you can see in order to squeeze another sprocket onto the cassette, they've essentially pinned another one onto the back. So when fitted onto the free hub, this extra sprocket actually causes a slight overhang towards the spokes off the back of the free hub. And on some wheels, this can cause an issue. For example, my Drive 50D wheels that I've previously reviewed, I initially wanted to use these for the build, but the 12 speed cassette means this extra sprocket interferes with the kind of wide oversized hub design. So yeah, it just won't fit. I also tried fitting the 12 speed S road cassette that I showed earlier and uh, yeah, ran into the same issue. Now it's worth noting, I only had issues fitting this cassette onto wheels with carbon spokes, actually. Just, just something about the hub design with those. All my other wheels with regular steel spokes, yeah, no problem. So yeah, just something to be aware of if you're considering this group set. Anyway, let's get this fitted and crack on. Okay, so the first thing I'm gonna get done on the frame here is actually get the rear brake housing fed through the frame. I figure this is the best time considering there's, <laughs> there's nothing on the frame at the moment, so it's gonna be relatively easy to feed it through. However, before I can do this, there's one, <laughs> one little adjustment I need to make. Okay, so this is where the cables feed into the frame, and you can see they've got these little frame stop inserts here, and I've pulled this one out. It would normally sit in there like that. So this is where the rear brake housing is gonna go through, and you can see that hole is just not big enough. So I'm gonna have to drill that out in order to be able to feed the cable through it, but it's, it's little extra steps like this that you wouldn't have to do on a more expensive frame, but still not a big deal. So I'll drill that out and then get the housing for the rear brake fed through the frame. So I stuck that little cap in my in my vise and drilled it out. Yeah, easy peasy. I then made a start on the cabling, but yeah, yeah, it wasn't long at all before I ran into another issue with this cheap frame. Uh, right, so I've run into another slight issue with this frame, which I figured might be a problem when I first looked at it, but now I'm actually building it. Yeah, I can see it's an issue, so I'll zoom in there and then bump up the ISO here. So yeah, this is the hole where the rear the rear housing comes out of the frame for the, uh, for the rear brake. And that hole is just too small. So it's about three and a half, maybe four millimeters in diameter and it needs to be five. So I need to find a way to ream that hole out slightly, either with some uh, little jeweler's files, needle nose jeweler's files, or maybe drill it out, I'm not too sure. But yeah, let's see what I can do. So I decided against drilling it out. And uh, yeah, I just sat there with a set of jeweler's files widening the hole. Um, yeah, I got my set on eBay for like 10 quid and I thought I would never use them, to be honest. But on, ch on cheap frames like this one, I end up using them all the time. So probably worth getting a set if you intend on building up one of these bikes yourself. Um, anyway, once that was done, I got started routing the rear brake housing through the frame, or at least trying to. So yeah, it turned out to be so, so fiddly. Normally the housing feeds through the frame, no problem. But on this particular one, I think because the internal finish is, is pretty rough, it kept catching and getting stuck and I had to have multiple goes at getting it fitted. Right then, I finally got the housing for the rear brake fed through the frame. It took me about an hour and a half to get to this point, such a nightmare and I even had to like bust out all this like specialist kit for helping pull through cables and the endoscope I even had to use that to see kind of what was happening inside here basically there's loads of unfinished sharp edges around here that kept catching the uh, the housing and it kept like getting caught so I had to keep taking it back out filing it down trying again I used oil to like help it get pulled through yeah what a pain in the ass, but that's the price you pay for a dirt cheap frame, right? But anyway, it's in place. So um, yeah, next up, I'm gonna fit the uh, rear brake, the front brake, and probably slap the derailleurs on as well. A few minutes later. Okay, right, made some decent progress. So you can see got both, got both wheels on here, and the rear brake caliper there, it's uh, bolted down and, and secured in place, pretty much in its final position. And have a listen, no brake rub at all, which is great. So maybe the rear, 
brake mount wasn't quite as bad as I thought it would be on the frame, so that's that's pretty cool. I've also fitted the rear derailleur there, that went on fine, and the front derailleur is on too. Now on the fork here, you can see I've got the front brake caliper mounted, and again, it's secured down basically in this final position, and it doesn't rub either on the disc, which is really cool. So next up, gonna get the fork put on here, so I'll put the bearings and the headset kit in place, put a bit of grease in there as well, so I'll get the headset set up, put the forks in, and then I'll start fiddling about with the uh, handlebars here. So I'll probably get these on and potentially cable the uh, rear brake run through the bars because that's going to be a little bit of a pain, uh, I, uh, I think. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, let's get cracking and I'll check back in with you in a few minutes. Right then, so fitting headset bearings is easy enough. Just put some multi-purpose grease on the bearing seat and pop the included bearing in with the angled outer race face down like, uh, like so. The larger lower bearing gets installed pretty much the same way. Just slap in some grease and put the bearing in with the angled race face up. Then put the separate crown race onto the fork. Now I've mentioned this before, but not every fork will require this. If like this one here, it's got a 45 degree angle molded into the carbon at the bottom of the steerer, you can usually omit this separate crown race. But on this build, it is specifically needed. Anyway, next, get the fork through the frame, stick on some headset spacers if you need them and get the bars mounted. Now these bars are internally rooted, which is cool. And you can see here, I'm using the cable routing tool that I showed earlier to pull the housing through. It's actually the first time I've used one of these. And while it's not 100%, necessary yeah it certainly makes this job much easier okay right so quick update for you and i've made some uh, good progress as you, <laughs> as you can see so i've put the uh, the bars on here and you can see i've got about four four and a half centimeters worth of headset spaces here so that that's quite excessive but i'd rather err on the side of caution with this and have it taller because i can always drop the handlebars lower so i'll cut the steerer tube later on but for now i've got the brake cable housings for both the uh, the rear and the front brake as well actually run through the bars and the next step would be for me to kind of cut the uh, cable housings to length but before i do that i'll need to get the shifters mounted so i'll get these mounted on next and then once they're on i can start looking at the uh, gear cable runs as well so i'll run the gear cable housings through the bar and uh, match that up to the frame um, but it's worth pointing out the yeah well running cables through these bars was, was actually surprisingly easy. So I used that little tool down there, which I kind of, well, you might have seen earlier, um, to help me pull the, the brake housings through the bars. But they were so much easier to cable than those toe seek ones, which I've got hanging down there. They were an absolute nightmare, but these ones were actually pretty easy. So yeah, high hopes for these bars. And I think they're gonna be quite comfortable as well. Anyway, enough of that. I'm gonna crack on and I'll check back in with you in a bit. Right then, mounting shifters is easy enough. Just fit them on loosely at first, then stand over the bike and try to position them where it feels comfortable. Then once in place, clamp them down, but especially with carbon bars like these ones, be careful not to over tighten the clamping nut and use a torque wrench if you, uh, if you can. You, de you definitely don't wanna crack the bars at this stage. Uh, next up, I'm getting the gear cable housing routed. Now cabling bikes from scratch is probably one of the most time intensive jobs on a build like this. And I don't go into masses of detail here, but I do have a whole video dedicated to the topic if you're interested. And while I've got you, if I could ask you to subscribe and maybe hit the like button as well, that'd be amazing. It's, it's literally just me filming these videos and putting it all together. So any help at all would be massively appreciated. Um, anyway, enough whinging from me and let's get back to it. Okay, cool. So I've got both shifters attached to the bars, as you can see, and they're basically clamped onto their, well, in their final positions, really. And you'll also be able to see I've got the gear cable housing and the brake cable housing coming at the back of both sets of shifters, which is great. And then they feed through the bars and pop out the bottom. So cabling was relatively straightforward. It took a little bit of time because the spaces are quite tight in there, but I got that done. Now, the last time I fitted a pair of L2 shifters to a bike, uh, if you've seen the video, you might recall that there was a missing washer behind the clamping bolt which is in here which meant that the bolt itself had a tendency to eat its way through the plastic of the shifter so let me pull this back and i'll show you the update that l2 have made okay so i've pulled back the rubber of the uh, of the shifter there to expose that bolt and you'll see behind it there's a well there's a washer now that wasn't actually there in the last set of uh, l2 shifters that i installed and it basically meant that without that washer the bolt started to eat its way into the plastic as i tightened it up so it's nice to see l2 include a washer in this one so um uh, yeah all in all these were pretty easy easy to install these shifters here, not too bad at all. But next up, I'm gonna cut this steerer tube to length, so let's crack on. Okay, cool, so, um, yeah, I need to cut the steerer tube, and I've marked it to, well, basically marked 
where I need to get this cut here and I'm gonna be using this. So a little hacksaw. Now I'm, I'm sure there are neater ways to do this and I think you can get stuff that you like, what well, a little tool that you clamp on to keep the cut nice and uh, nice and level but I've, <laughs> I've not got it and I've done this a number of times in the past and it's worked for me every time. So that's what I'm gonna do. This time I've got a mask and also, yeah, a, a water bottle so I can spray the area down with water. Um, essentially, carbon fiber dust is a no bueno for your lungs. So I'm gonna basically try and stop as much dust as I can from getting into the air and I'll wear a mask as I do it as well. Um, now, when you're cutting it, you wanna make sure you take it nice and easy if you're gonna use a hacksaw and just try and keep the cut at 90 degrees. So just keep it nice and level and you should be good to go. So yeah, let's crack on. Right, so like I said, take it nice and easy here and really try to keep the cut level. Now, I probably should have clamped the fork down or something, but as this is a truly professional uh, channel, <laughs> I just stuck it on top of an old t-shirt and tried my best to hold it still. But it got the job done, so I was happy and that's a win, baby. Okay, so you might have seen at the end there, there was a little flake of carbon there that was kind of clinging on at the end um, as, it, as it kind of snapped off a little, a little bit of carbon there. So I just kind of picked it off and then where it fell off, um, I used a bit of sandpaper here and just very lightly sanded it to stop any potential fraying in the future in that spot. Um, you could seal it with a bit of nail polish if you're that bothered, but I'm certainly not. So I think it's, it's fine as is. And then now it's done, I'm also gonna take the sandpaper and just uh, sand up the edges there, just again, to stop any fraying in the future. But it looks nice and straight, so I'm happy with it anyway. Um, yeah, let's move on. Okay, right, so the headset is all set up now, basically. So it was cut to length, and yeah, I've put the headset clamp in there, clamped it all on, it's holding it nice and tightly, all the bearings are preloaded properly, and everything. Now, it does look a little bit goofy with so many headset spaces on there, but like I said, I can drop it down uh, later today if, if, if I need to. Now, um, while I was at it, I also finished off the last of the cabling up the front, so this is the uh, cable for the front derailleur here, and I've also put an inline barrel adjuster there, which is cool, and then I've got the rear brake and the uh, rear derailleur there. So um, yeah, the rear derailleur, if I quickly show you, it all meshes up really nicely. Um, seems nice and crisp, nice and precise, so happy with that. However, the, the front derailleur, I've got a few concerns about this. Okay, so this front derailleur here is an older, your style front derailleur, and the problem with it is it just requires so much tension on this cable here to uh, to make the move up into the big ring. It's not particularly smooth, and I have a feeling that the spring in the back there is too strong, it's too stout, and it's just, yeah, it requires a lot of force to make that move. Now, I've tried oiling up the moving parts to make it easier, but that didn't really help. So I have a feeling that this, well, basically, this little arm here is what you use to make the shift, so you push that to kind of make the shift into the big ring. I think that might end up snapping, because it's only made of plastic, but I'll just have to get it out on the road and, and see if it fails. But time will tell. So the brake calipers are set up front and back as well, and if I spin the wheel, no disc rub, which is amazing. And let me just pull the, pull the lever here. Yeah, feels really good actually, which is no doubt helped by this uh, compressionless housing that I've installed. But yeah, the front brake feels great. And it's much the same story at the back here. So the back brake feels nice and snappy as well. Now I've had issues in the past where the caliper wasn't returning all the way. So it would get compressed and then the arm just wouldn't spring back all the way. But um, on this time, absolutely no problem. So the caliper returns all the way, basically first time, which is amazing. So yeah, I'm really interested to get these out on the road and try them out. But yeah, we're on the kind of final stretch now. So get the bottom bracket in, fit the crank, get the uh, chain on, fit the saddle and do the bar tape. So last little bits to button this build up and we'll be done. So yeah, let's crack on. Okay, fitting the BB and the cranks is pretty easy. So during my last video, I actually said the bottom bracket cups were a BB86 standard on this frame. However, this is completely false. As many of you pointed out in the comments, it's BSA. And frankly, I should know better. So rest assured, I gave myself a stern talking to. You're an absolute moron, do you know that? Why don't you just check the fucking script? Anyway, uh, stick a bit of grease or anti-seize compound on the threads and get it installed. Now you actually need a SRAM dub bottom bracket wrench 
for this particular BB. So yeah, bear that in mind. Um, after that, whack in the crank set. And again, a bit of grease on the crank axle is a good idea here. And yeah, tighten up the crank arm bolt. Getting the chain sized up next. This is pretty simple. So I tend to size via the largest sprocket on the cassette and the largest chain ring. But there are loads of guides out there for this as well. And finally, I clip the cables to length. But rather than aluminium cable ends, I save some massive weight here with heat shrink tubing. This right here is going to make all the difference. Trust me. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, stick a fork in the, in the bike because it's done. Okay, so here it is, fully built and completed. And I, for one, think this thing looks pretty damn good, actually. Now, I've got, I've got to admit, I've already ridden this a couple of miles by now. So what's the verdict? And uh, yeah, let's start with the overall cost and the weight. Okay, so this is the part of the build that everyone will undoubtedly skip to. So, uh, welcome. <laughs> now, the final cost uh, of the build was uh, £1,023.47p or £1,174, which you can see in the spreadsheet that I've, I've thrown up. Now, the one thing that I didn't include was the import duties that I paid on the frame and the wheels because A, you might not be in the UK and B, even if you are, there's no guarantee that you'll pay the same as I did. But if you want to kind of ballpark it, it's about 50 to 70 quid on top of that, something in that area. Right then, the weigh-in. So considering this frame set, so frame fork and seat post is a 58 centimeter one, so large or extra large, it weighs just under two kilos on its own actually. Yeah, I was expecting this full build to be about eight and a half kilos, maybe a little bit more. Yeah, I was, I was pleasantly surprised. So without pedals or bottle cages, which is how virtually all bikes online are weighed. This thing comes in at 7.76 kilograms. So not bad at all, actually, considering <laughs> yeah, what I paid for it. Um, now with lighter wheels, a lighter cassette, and some lighter calipers, which I've, I've showed you. Yeah, I think I could get this below 7.5, actually. So we'll, we'll see how that goes. Um, but just for a point of comparison for you, this is what a thousand pounds, well, just over a thousand, will currently get you from Cannondale. So it's the 2023 CAD Optimo 1, and you can, you can see the price there. It's rim brake with an aluminium frame, some basic aluminium training wheels, external cabling, and weighs in at 9.3 kilograms for a much smaller 54 centimeter frame. Uh, so, so yeah, al although it's just the one example, I think, <laughs> yeah, I think it does go to show how good value this build really is. Now, massive caveats here, as I've only ridden this like 40 miles since I've built it. Um, but yeah, I'm really impressed with it. So the, the frame is quite stiff and unforgiving, but I would expect that considering it's a kind of chunky aero construction. Um, but once you get this thing up to speed on the flats, it absolutely flies, which is really cool. And the group set as well, this L2 group set is spot on. Once you get it dialed in, the uh, shifting is perfect. There's no other word for it. <laughs> no other word for it, really. So yeah, nice and quiet when you're out on the road with light, crispy shifting up and down the range. Now, I was slightly concerned with 12 sprockets at the back, as opposed to kind of 10 or 11. The indexing needs to be really precise in order for it to function effectively. But yeah, really, <laughs> really good. And the front derailleur has got a lot better with use as well. So it doesn't require as much force to bring the chain up into the big ring. Now, the one massive downside with this group set that you, <laughs> you can't really ignore, it's virtually impossible to upshift at the back or the front when you're in the drops. So I already knew this going into this build because I've used this group set in the past, which I've already done a video on actually, the L2 R9 group set on another bike, the one that's just on the wall up there. Um, yeah, it's virtually identical in design. Um, and yeah, while it is a little bit annoying, you do get used to it. And like I said, the, sh the shifting with this thing is really, really nice. The brakes on this bike have also really impressed me as well. So the calipers themselves are the upgraded versions of uh, some Z Race brakes, which I've used actually for a couple thousand miles last year. And I, I can really feel it actually. So they seem to have a little bit more bite, which is cool. Now I obviously need to put some more miles on them, but they seem to be pretty much as good as my current favorites. So these are, uh, these Juintec F1s, plus the stock pads that come with those calipers seem to be pretty good as well. However, it's not all good news with this bike. I'm slightly worried about these cheap carbon integrated bars here. They seem quite fragile and they're really flexy under load. So um, yeah, I don't have 
don't have a lot of faith in those, so I'll be keeping an eye on them. Um, and the SUMC chain that comes with this L2 group set, yeah, that worries me too. So I've, I've had an SUMC quick link, one of these ones actually, fail on me under load a couple months back. So I was pulling away from the traffic lights and my chain exploded, which is, um, yeah, always fun. Uh, <laughs> plus, yeah, check this out. Okay, so I just got back of a wet ride on this, uh, on this new bike. It's like the second time I've ridden it. And I'm just drying off the chain here. And can you see the like little flakes of metal in there? There's quite a big one in the middle there. And there's a few smaller flakes there. You can see them sort of reflecting the light. Um, so I'm not, not too sure if it's this SUMC chain. I mean, I'm slightly conscious that this is probably not, not the highest quality chain in the world. See, I'm not sure if it's the chain, the the cassette there, or maybe it's off the chain chain rings, um, but still, yeah, slightly concerning. I've <laughs> definitely never seen that before, but yeah, I'm definitely gonna keep an eye on this um, this chain because yeah, we'll see, we'll see. Maybe maybe it'll last, but I'm not holding out, holding out much hope, but um, yeah, weird to see, that's for sure. So yeah, definitely gonna be keeping an eye on that chain, uh, yeah. And lastly, underneath the bottom bracket here, where the cables are rooted, the cables themselves directly contact the resin of the frame. So you would normally expect to see some kind of nylon or plastic plate for the cables to run over. But yeah, in this instance, they just contact the resin. So I'm slightly concerned the cables are gonna wear into it over time and cause some issues. I, I don't know really, so I, I guess we'll see. Um, but anyway, what are my plans for this bike? moving forward and yeah was it worth it well let's uh figure that out in the final thoughts right so first off i'm obviously going to keep riding this thing for the foreseeable future but like i mentioned in the frame video which was the last episode i yeah i'm gonna take it easy for the first few hundred miles just to make sure nothing catastrophically fails on me so i will report back in once i throw in some decent mileage on this rude boy now just to reiterate if it wasn't clear the final product here this bike looks pretty damn good especially considering what i paid for it but the build itself was a massive pain i mean it took way longer than it should have essentially because the cabling especially running that rear brake housing was an absolute nightmare basically i mean i had to bust out all of my tricks to get it through the frame and even then i spent ages filing away it was just super frustrating and that's ultimately one of the reasons why this frame was so cheap so i didn't pay much money for the frame but you could argue what i saved i kind of paid back with uh, with my time spent sat there like fettling with the frame and getting getting everything in place i mean if you bought yourself a yolio frame or if you can afford it one from like windspace something like that i can pretty much guarantee you won't have to sit there <laughs> filing holes in the carbon but like th that's the whole game right it's it's super frustrating at the time but when you get these ultra budget alternatives you learn to expect this kind of thing plus I love all this fucking bollocks anyway, so <laughs> there is that to consider as well. So um, yeah, anyway, that is the end of the episode. So subscribe if you like this kind of thing. Hit the like button if uh, uh, for a moment watching this episode, you were uh, spared the crushing existential dread that we all feel when we're spending moments with our own thoughts. <laughs> oh God, that's a bit dark. Um, and if you've got any questions or any comments, uh, then yeah, leave me one of those as well and we can have a chat. Um, <laughs> Jesus, what is it? It's uh, coming up to five past nine. I've got a few more B-roll shots to do. And then um, I might try and squeeze in a little bike ride on this thing. Um, but I mean, who cares, right? None of, none of you are here watching this. I think like 0.5% of you will still be watching at this point. Um, so if you are here, drop a, a baguette emoji in the chat. So I <laughs> I know you're here watching me. Right, anyway, anyway, enough of that. I'm gonna go. So I'll see you in the uh, in the next one. And, and do stay tuned, because I, I am gonna report back on this after I've stuck some miles on it. Right, see you later. Ciao.
Right then, quick bonus clip at the end here. So I finished with the edit. Um, uh, I think it was yesterday I finished it up. Um, so I'm going to just uh, stick this on the end. But I'm about to go out on the on a ride with this bike. And I've ridden it about 150 miles at this point. So I was going around um, doing some kind of safety checks. And this is kind of a, a good bit of advice, I guess. So uh, I go around and check all the, the bolts and make sure the stem clamp is tight and the, the saddle isn't moving and stuff. So I was going around checking all the bolts were still kind of holding in place and everything was safe. And have a look at this. Yes. Look at that massive crack there that's around that steerer clamp. Yeah, it's ridiculous, really. I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's basically knackered now. This thing is unsafe to ride. So I did this bolt up to four Newton meters um, with, my, with, my, with my torque wrench there. And I also applied some, uh, some carbon fiber grip compound there when I, when I put it on. And look at it. It's, yeah, that massive crack goes all the way over the top and all the way underneath as well. So yeah, this isn't safe to ride anymore. So um, yeah, I guess looking at it, I can kind of understand why, because there's only there's only one bolt there holding it onto the onto the steerer tube. Whereas most um, most kind of stem clamps have have two two bolts there. So those have two bolts, and my set of bars here, these carbon integrated bars, they have two bolts there. Um, as well, so I can kind of understand why it would crack, but still, it's <laughs> really disappointing. But I, I mean, I can't say I'm surprised because, like I said, these were quite flexy and they don't seem super well made. So yeah, if you were thinking about getting a, an RXL SL handlebar, especially one of well, one of them with this kind of single stem clamp here, a single bolt stem clamp, yeah, definitely give it a miss because yeah, really, really disappointing. Everything else. On the bike is uh, absolutely fine up to this point. It's literally just that one uh, one bolt there that's failing on me. So <laughs> really, really disappointing, really. But I mean, it's not a massive deal because I've actually got another set of bars coming in the post in the next few days. So I'll just swap these out, I suppose. But yeah, a bit annoying. Anyway, um, there it is. Quick update for you. So I'll see you in the next video. Ciao.